So we're moving on to chapter six now where we're going to talk about energy analysis of control volumes or of open systems now. We've been talking about closed systems. We've talked already some about open systems, but we're really going to focus in on some of the details and describe some things like um, enthalpy in this, in this uh, chapter. So in this slide, what we're trying to illustrate is the conservation of mass. And this is a very important concept for open systems because in closed systems, we always assume that the mass was constant. So um, we didn't have any mass crossing the boundaries of our system. In a control volume, we are going to have mass passing in and out of our system and even sometimes accumulating as it passes in and out of the system. And we'll talk about how we take that into account. Now, one of the things, one of the principles and foundational principles of both thermodynamics and fluid mechanics is that mass is conserved. So it doesn't matter what happens. So here is an example of a chemical reaction. So we have 16 kilograms of O2, two kilograms of water. We can burn these together and the output or the product of this combustion process is going to be water. Now even though there was a lot of heat released, even though there was a lot of energy uh, exchanged, molecules uh, got moved around, ultimately mass is always conserved regardless of the uh, circumstances surrounding it, mass is conserved in all cases. Now some of the things that we're going to have to define in order to describe how mass is conserved is we're going to have to describe something called mass flow rate. So up to now we just talked about mass. So in a closed system we typically talked about the total mass of a system, but here we're talking about the flow rate of the system. So we have, uh, here's maybe this is water or something here passing through a pipe. Well we're going to have a flow or a way to measure or quantify how much flow is coming through this pipe. And for that we use this equation right here. Mass flow rate is equal to the density of our fluid times the average velocity times the cross-sectional area. So let's get into each one of those terms. Now average velocity, here you see the definition here, is basically the average of this velocity profile. So if we look, if we cut a pipe in half uh, and we looked at the cross-sectional flow through the pipe, so let's say that we could do that. We could cut a pipe in half and we could take a look at the flow in the pipe or we could measure the velocity here flowing through a pipe. What we would see is that the flow in the pipe would be zero along the walls. So the a fluid likes to stick to these walls, okay? And that's called the no-slip condition, where something sticks to the walls and the velocity is zero here. As we go away from the wall, you'll see that the flow reaches a maximum point in the center line. If we're looking at this profile, though, how do we take the average? Will we add up all of the different velocity values and we take an average of all these values? And that's what this equation is saying here. That average value is just assumed as a straight line across the entire pipe length, when in reality it actually varies at every location away from the wall up to the center line. So you can see here that we're actually taking an average velocity here. So using this average velocity and the cross-sectional area is going to be the area that is normal to this flow direction here. So if we're talking about a pipe, we're talking about a pipe diameter if we're looking at the flow through a pipe here, okay? And the density of the fluid is just the density of the fluid. And we can express the density of the fluid either as rho or one over the specific volume. Now, now that we define mass flow rate, how do we define the conservation of mass? Well, the conservation of mass is easily described as what's coming in the mass flow rate that's coming in, the mass flow rate that's leaving the, here in this case is a bathtub, and whatever accumulates in our system. That takes into account all the mass that's coming in, out, or accumulating. So 
writing it in uh, word terms, we have the total mass entering, total mass exiting, and then we have the net change, which is the accumulation of water in this tub here if the drain doesn't drain fast enough. All right. Typically, we express it like this. Mass in minus mass out equals the change in mass of our system with time. And this is our accumulation term here. We can write the conservation of mass several different ways, though. So uh, here we have the total mass uh, within the control volume. So this is a way of defining the total mass in our control volume. So however we define our volume here is just the density times the volume. And we sum up the, the density across an entire volume shape. Now if we take that per unit time, we can express it like this. And then we can also express if there's anything coming in and out of here, we can express it using a dot product. So if the velocity is facing the same direction or is in line parallel to this normal vector off of this surface, we would call it, we would be positive. So this dot product would be positive if these two vectors are parallel. If these two vectors are going the opposite direction, so one is facing this way, the other is going into this, that dot product is negative, right? So we can express the mass flow rate coming in and out of this control volume using a dot product. So what you may see and what you may see me use uh, in the class is you may see me use this expression for the conservation of mass where I have the accumulation of the system of, or accumulation of mass in the system plus what is coming in and what is coming out of this system and this dot product tells us whether it's coming in or whether it's coming out this n is just this normal vector sticking out of the surface here so to be always facing out of our surface whatever we're interested in and our velocity is either going to be pointing out with the normal vector which means it's positive so mass flow rate out is positive and if it's pointing in, that means the flow is going in, and that would be negative. So you, can, you may see it also written like this, where we have the accumulation in the system is equal to the sum of all the mass flow rates into the system. And that's because here, you'll see they moved it over. Here it's equal to zero. Here they moved it over. So it is negative, but it's moved over here in this case. So it's equal to the sum of all the mass flow rates in, minus the sum of all the mass flow rates out of the system. And we can have multiple things coming into this control volume, and we can have multiple things coming out of this control volume. And mass flow rate is not a vector, so we're not really interested in what direction it's going in. We're just interested in keeping track of everything that's coming in and everything that is coming out. So let's say something is steady. And when I say something is steady, I'm talking that it, I mean that it's not varying with time. So this term here would go to zero. Okay, so if nothing is varying with time or we don't have any accumulation of mass in the system, everything that's coming into this control volume is coming out of this control volume, we can simplify our conservation of mass equation to be sum of the mass flow rates in is equal to sum of the mass flow rates out. And in this case, we have two inputs. So on this side, we would have 3 plus 2 kilograms per second has to be equal to 5 kilograms per second coming out of the bottom of this tank as well. If we have incompressible flow, which incompressible again means that density does not change from our inlet to our exit point, we can assume that the, we can simplify this term rho AV1 equals rho AV2 by canceling out these densities since they are equal to each other. So we'd have AV, which is our volumetric flow rate, equal to our exiting volumetric flow rate, okay? So the volumetric flow rate coming in is equal to volumetric flow rate coming out. Now, this is very important that there is no such thing as a conservation of volume principle. This is only the case, special case for incompressible flow or a case where we don't have any density variations. And another condition that is met here is that it is a steady flow.
Okay, so there's some very special uh, things that need to be fulfilled whenever we ha use this uh, equation. So the last section I want to talk about here in this lecture is flow work. So we covered conservation of mass. Mass cannot be created or destroyed, just like energy cannot be created or destroyed. We're going to talk about the flow work now. So you may have heard me talk about this already. Uh, and using this is how we end up uh, using the term enthalpy. Uh, but let's talk about it a little bit more here. Now, in a flow, so as opposed to a c closed system where we didn't have any flow in or out of the boundary, here we have flow. Let's say this is our control volume here in this middle part. Well, we have a certain amount of work that's needed to push this fluid from this location to this location. That is called the flow energy or flow work. We can call it either one. I make I so, so I may interchange between the two. But as this control volume passes through this boundary, it's nice if we really want to take into account and the conservation of energy, which we'll do for several of these problems, we need to take into account also this energy that's associated with pushing this fluid into and out of this control volume. And this is a nice illustration, okay? This is not what happens in actuality, but uh, we can visualize it better this way. So the pressure or the force that's pushing our flow or this block here, okay, we have a pressure that's pushing this block. If we have pressure times area, which is this cross-sectional area here, we would have a force that's pushing this block of water into our control volume. If we want to talk about work, we talk about a force times a distance. And the distance here would be the depth into the page of this block of water that we're pushing into here. So if we take the force times the distance of this, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, L here corresponds to the distance that we're pushing this water by. I apologize for that. So if we talk about this force times the distance that we're pushing this by, force, we can also say is this pressure times this cross-sectional area. We can we know that the area times a characteristic length here would be a volume. So we, we uh, write this flow work as a pressure times a volume. Or written per unit mass, we can call this pressure times a specific volume. And the units of this are kilojoules per kilogram. Now how do we take this term into account. So when we had a closed system, this was our energy term. So remember our first con our first law of thermodynamics says Q minus W equals the change in energy. And our change in energy was the change in internal energy from state two to one to two, change in kinetic from state one and two, and change in potential energy from state one and two. We can rewrite this, since this is per unit mass, as u plus v squared over 2 plus gz. If we have a flowing fluid, like we have in an open system, so they've replaced this e with this theta, means the same thing, except now we have a PV term, or we have this work, en uh, work energy associated, or flow energy associated with this uh, term. So. What we do for convenience to account for this flow energy is we combine these two terms. So we combine internal energy and we combine PV here into one term called enthalpy. So that's this H value that you see here. All right, so we have enthalpy. So it's a new term and you'll see it defined right next to internal energy in your textbook in the back. So and you'll see us that we use this now for open systems instead of internal energies, we're going to use enthalpy, which also takes into account this flow energy that is associated with the moving fluid. We can write it several ways. So if we want to talk about the total energy that's transported, we can talk either about the mass or we want to talk about the rate of transport, we can use the mass flow rate. And I would say this second one here is more common. 
that we're going to typically use and discuss the equation or the first law of thermodynamics using this second term here. So that concludes uh, this lecture on uh, chapter 6. I will be uh, having one more of these lectures on chapter 6 and then we'll solve some problems.